Welcome back. So in this video lecture, we're going to talk a little bit more about um, human sexual behavior. We'll talk about pheromones, and we'll also talk about um, parenting behavior, a little bit more on that. So as I alluded to earlier in the lecture, we actually know a lot more about animal sexuality than we do about human sexuality. And this is in large part because sex is such a taboo topic. It wasn't actually until Alfred Kinsey in the 1940s that we first started studying sets. Kinsey, a biologist by training, asked friends and colleagues about their sexual history. You can imagine how this went in the 1940s. Um, he eventually went on to conduct massive survey-based studies looking at sexual behavior and preferences for men and women. These studies were very controversial, but they also revealed a significant amount of information about sexual behavior. Among them, the fact that virtually all men masturbate, uh, college-educated individuals are more likely to engage in oral sex, and that engaging in homosexual behavior, even for heterosexual individuals, is actually not that uncommon. Um, there's actually a Kinsey Institute at the University of Indiana that is well known for such research today. Of course, there are two ways you can study sexual behavior. You can ask people about it, or you can observe it. And this is a, the observing it is exactly what Masters and Johnson did in the late 50s through the early 70s. So I have a video on Masters and Johnson. I think it's really interesting. Um, I, a couple warnings. Well, one main warning. Uh, there's a little bit of nudity, which is probably okay because I think you're all over 18 and... Um, the book has some nudity as well, but if you don't want to see it or if you're under 18, just fast forward through this video, um, but if you're okay with that, uh, let me show the video and then we'll come back in a couple minutes and talk a little bit about the video. In the straight-laced 1950s, conducting research into sex presented some daunting challenges. For example, when Masters and Johnson began their work at Washington University in 1957, they wondered where they would find volunteers for the project. But to their surprise, they discovered that many ordinary people were willing to serve as subjects. Curiously enough, getting research subjects was easy. If you waited, you had to wade through the the fraternities that sent their pledges in to to be interviewed, and you know the poor dears were stammering, stuttering, and so on because they didn't come of their own free will, and that was very easy to screen out, of course, and kind of fun in a in a way. So Masters and Johnson embarked on the first major scientific study of sexual response ever conducted. Masters and Johnson have since destroyed the films they made of their early studies, but later researchers repeated their work, including films such as these. Over a 10-year period, Masters and Johnson observed and took measurements from 700 male and female subjects masturbating or having intercourse in the laboratory. They once estimated they had studied over 10,000 orgasms. They were the first to film a woman's orgasm internally using an artificial penis of clear plastic that contained a light and camera. In the late 50s and early 60s, this kind of research would have scandalized many if they had known it was going on. I couldn't think of any way that I could prepare the public for, for the, the shock value of finding out that such research existed. They were superbly courageous of doing something against the stream of society and to uh, delve into some kind of study about a taboo top a topic, something between the waist and the knees. And not only did they study it, they observed it. So from the beginning, masters knew it was imperative that the research be conducted in relative secrecy and he was very careful to shield the project from outside criticism by lining up support from the university and from local clergy. In 1964, Masters moved the project off campus, establishing the Reproductive Biology Research Foundation. It was financed by a few private donations and small foundation grants. 
Masters himself took no pay from the foundation or the medical school, supporting himself solely from his gynecological practice. Masters and Johnson attempted to report their findings to the medical community, but the most prestigious journals rejected their research papers. By 1966, though, after 12 years of work, Masters and Johnson were ready to publish their research in book form. At the time, America's attitudes about sex were becoming more liberal, but little new information had become public. In the mid-1960s, we knew more about how to get a man to the moon and back than we knew about what was happening inside the vagina of a sexually stimulated woman. Even in the mid-1960s, some people thought anything related to sex was pornographic. Masters and Johnson knew that, so when they brought out their book, Human Sexual Response, they did everything they could to control the potential for sensationalism. Does it concern you that thrill-seekers, uh, people of that sort, uh, will make it a point to try to get a copy of your study? No, I don't really think so. Uh, if they uh, are looking for pornography or uh, that type of material, they're going to be disappointed because I can assure you that every effort was made uh, to remove uh, this type of, of material from the text. Masters and Johnson wrote the book as a medical textbook in deliberately dense scientific language. They chose a conservative Boston publisher, Little Brown, and held briefings for small groups of science writers in a Boston hotel suite just before publication. We weren't marketing. We just didn't want the books burned. We just didn't want them to be ignored for what they were or misunderstood. The book was a sensation. Little Brown released 15,000 copies, and they sold out in one day. How has the demand been running? Wonderful. <laughs> uh, beyond our fondest expectations. I noticed uh, you put it in the window, so you have no... Uh... It's a hot property. <laughs> I want to sell it. Human Sexual Response went on to sell over 250,000 copies in just the first year. It held firm on the bestseller list for six months. Do people apologize for ordering it or try to pass themselves no, off no, as the students or anything? On the contrary. I mean, this is, a, this is an enlightened age and people are interested in sex. Compared to the 1950s, it was an enlightened age as America's sexual mores were changing. If the Masters and Johnson book had arrived in 55 or 1960, <laughs> it would have been <laughs> blasted. It arrived at almost the perfect time. It arrived at a time in which people were throwing off a lot of the taboos and repression related to their own sexuality. In human sexual response, Masters and Johnson identified four phases of orgasm and detailed the physiological responses in each. Some of their findings overturned popular misconceptions, particularly in regard to female sexuality. The book publicized the ability of many women to have multiple orgasms. And it showed that physiologically, a woman's orgasm was the same, no matter what the stimulation. This overturned Sigmund Freud's notion that there were vaginal orgasms from intercourse, which were proper and mature, and clitoral orgasms, which were neurotic and immature. And this notion that there were two kinds of orgasms and one was superior, psychologically, emotionally, to the other, was very much prevalent in the culture at the time. But Masters and Johnson's work, what they said essentially is that an orgasm is an orgasm, however achieved. What it did is it gave women a sense of both entitlement and a sense of um, inclination to pursue it, so that women became much more eager to achieve and experience orgasm. Human sexual response became a bestseller, but not everyone was thrilled with an explicit textbook about sex. The book was published on a Monday, and by Friday the mail began coming in in sacks. I mean that literally. We had to employ three secretaries on a part-time basis to uh, answer the mail. Uh, and about 80% of the mail was dropped dead. Previously, Dr. Masters had received... 
As you can see, while daunting, the research by Masters and Johnson taught us a great deal about sex. They observed individuals engaging in masturbation and sexual intercourse, and as I mentioned, they estimated that they observed over 10,000 complete cycles of sexual response. Their methods were untraditional, sometimes using prostitutes even, and sometimes assigning individuals into assigned couples for their research activities, so things that you wouldn't likely do today. However, as was mentioned, there were many discoveries that they came up with that we didn't know before. One of the discoveries was the four stages of sexual response, so that's excitement, plateau, orgasm, and resolution. The excitement phase is fairly similar for both men and women, um, as you have the phallus, which is where either the penis or the clitoris becomes engorged with blood, making it erect. In women, you also have a parasympathetic activity that results in lubricating fluids being released into the vagina. Sexual stimulation can also lead to plateau and orgasm, which for both men and women is accompanied by waves of contractions of the genital muscles. In the resolution phase, as we discussed earlier, there are some differences. Men um, have a refractory period after orgasm, but women do not. Masters and Johnson were also the first to conduct research on sexual responsiveness of older adults, um, finding that there is no absolute age that sexual abilities disappeared, although some aspects did become more difficult with age. They also did research on sexual dysfunction, such as premature ejaculation and impotence. Um, they also engaged in a controversial study where they tried to treat homosexuality back when homosexuality was a DSM diagnosis. So, researchers also found some differences in basic sexual behavior between men and women. Men, on average, have higher sex drives, as is reflected by more frequent masturbation, uh, more sexual fantasies, and the pursuits of s more pursuits of sexual contacts. In women, Emotions and cognitions play much more of a central role in sexual behavior. Women also place more emphasis on sexual intimacy within the context of a committed relationship. And this makes some sense evolutionarily when you think about it. Thus, for women, it seems like emotional intimacy and desire are both crucial for the initiation of sexual behavior. So I doubt this from the book, just to show how simple it is to understand female such draft. Uh, just kidding, of course. Um, but I do think this is a helpful diagram, and when I go through it, I actually find it easier to start down here, for whatever reason. So actually starting at um, arousal and response to sexual desire, and you can kind of see how it then goes back around. So if you have that arousal and response to sexual desire, it um, can lead to a couple things. One, you have sexual satisfaction because you're engaging in sexual contact, either with or without orgasm. And there are also some non-sexual rewards, so um, emotional intimacy, well-being, lack of negative effects from sexual avoidance. And these things both lead to increased motivation for sex. Uh, the sexual satisfaction, you know, as you can, if you've taken any, um, behavior therapy class would be reinforcing, that kind of made sense. And all these rewards provide multiple reasons why to engage in sets in the future. So this increases motivation, which increases one's willingness to become receptive um, to sets. So a couple things then predict future sexual behavior. So um, one is you have a innate desire. So people have different sex drives, and that can affect the willingness to be receptive, um, the psychological and biological processing, and also the subjective arousal. Um, also, you have to have the right stimuli, of course, and be in the right, pr right place of mind and have the arousal in order to make it to where you have, you have the arousal and you're ready for sexual activity. So all these things kind of play together. So you can see 
there's a lot going on here, but it does kind of make sense when you break it down like that, I think at least. Returning to pheromones. So there's a question of whether or not pheromones affect sexual behavior or whether we can even detect them at all. So you may have seen ads for pheromones. There are all these things of, you know, these ads mainly targeted for men about how to attract women and these scents that can be used in order to attract women. Well, again, we don't even know if they really, if these are even detected. Some of the strongest evidence for pheromones um, and the fact that they affect sexual behavior is the finding that women who live together often have their menstrual cycles synchronized. Believe it or not, this is actually still a controversial finding and the evidence for it is shaky at best. Thus, um, for you women who, you know, maybe you've had this happen, maybe you haven't, your anecdotal evidence is about as strong of evidence as we have. However, if it does happen, it suggests that there must be some pheromone um, that's being released that regulates menstrual cycles. There's also some evidence that body odors of men affect women's mate choices. And no, this is not just in whether or not a man is smelly. So MHCs are, um, major, as you can see here, major histocompatibility complexes. Um, they're a group of immune-related genes that um, come in many different forms. And it's believed to be part of the reason that people smell differently. And in general, women seem to prefer men who have MHCs that smell somewhat like their own MHCs, but not too similar um, as to not encourage inbreeding. Thus, the debate goes on. Um, so if we were on Mythbusters, we'd probably say this is plausible. It, you can argue that it has an effect. There's some evidence, but it's not clear that pheromones have any effect on sexual behavior. So now shifting to those parental behaviors we touched on earlier. Many species of young, including all young mammals, require their parents' attention to survive. One reason for this, is, this reliance on parents is because of differences in development at birth. So precoxial animals are born with well-developed sensory and motor systems. So examples of these are reptiles, chickens, and horses. These are animals that need less parental involvement at birth because they're already um, more developed. And this is, um, on the other side, you have um, ultracol um, animals. And these are less developed animals at birth, and thus they're more reliant upon their parents. So among them are um, songbirds, cats, and humans. And of course, both males and females may be involved in caring for the young, and especially in humans, the best results are when both are involved in caring for the young. So for, you know, again, we kind of know more about rats' behaviors and animal behaviors and human behaviors and some of this stuff. So a lot of this has been studied in rats. So with rats, rat mothers show four behaviors that are parental behaviors. Uh, nest building, crouching over the pups, retrieving the pups, and nursing. And what's been shown is that during pregnancy, exposure to certain hormones will prepare her brain the rat mother's brain, to display these um, maternal behaviors immediately after giving birth. So how do we know this? Well, one way is um, through parabiotic preparation. So parabiotic refers to a surgical procedure where two animals are actually um, joined to share a single blood supply. And this has been used in rats to show that the hormones circulating in the blood seem to be responsible for maternal behaviors because the non-pregnant rat mother, or you know, rat female, not mother in this case, this one, <laughs> will show the same behaviors as the actual mother. So it, it suggests that those hormones that are circulating do affect this behavior. Also, there's evidence, and I think this is really interesting, that um, your developmental history can also affect, um, affect your parental behaviors. So 
here we have a picture. I have a brief video I'll show you on this. We have a picture of a tiger with a pig, and it's um, due to the fact she was actually, the tiger was actually raised by a pig, as you'll see. And because of that, she's accepted piglets as her own children. So, kind of kind of cool because they're natural enemies, but yet that seems to be overcome by that behavioral history. So I'll show you this brief um, video and then that'll be the end of this video lecture. Burry, Thailand, May 2003. Under close supervision at the Sri Racha Zoo, caretakers put two sworn enemies together and created something surreal. Opposite ends of the food chain, saving each other's lives, ignoring every inborn instinct. In this display, a patient pig named Benjamash nurses three endangered Bengal tiger cubs. As she marks the tigers with her scent, Benjamash clearly doesn't care that some of her children have stripes. If you take a mother pig who's nursing, and provide her with a bunch of little babies who are hungry for milk, they're providing the right sort of cues that a baby pig would. Yet it gets even more incredible. At another exhibit just across the hall, you'll find one of Benjamaj's most successful surrogate daughters, a two-year-old female Bengal tiger named Saimai is returning the favor befriending six growing piglets. Looking closely at this remarkable scene, Saimai lets the suckling piglets climb all over her, even nipping and chewing her fur. Thanks to her unusual upbringing, Saimai doesn't see these infants as food. To her, they smell like family. It's a phenomenon called olfactory imprinting, and here it may be permanent. You might expect that there will be danger with these tigers and pigs growing up together, that one day the tigers are going to get big and say, oh, well, here are some pork chops. I would actually be surprised if they did respond to each other as if they were predator and prey. Yet others fear this bond is about to break. In the wild, Bengal tigers are lethal carnivores. One of their favorite meals, wild pigs. An adult tiger could consume nearly 60 pounds of pork in a single sitting. So far, with less than 2,500 Bengals in the wild, this strange scheme to raise endangered tigers in captivity seems to be working. Piglets and tigers here continue to interact under supervision. But the zoo takes a final precaution keeping the Bengal tigress well fed on six pounds of raw, non-piglet meat a day, just in case. <laughs>